good evening um, here in Berlin. Our project is dealing with the Quran on many layers. The layer that is involved this evening is the layer of context. Research about the context of the Quran is crucial to understand history. And we are very happy that Philip Forness is our guest this evening and that we could already carry out a large discussion today in our premises in Potsdam. Our project is a digital project um, for all its research outcomes and also for the texts of the environment of the Quran represented by these, um, so to say, by this cluster of different scripts and languages around the Quran. Um, our project's goal is history of the text on manifold levels. Um, I just jump into the Arabian cultural space because that's where we are. We are in Arabia, in the Arabian Peninsula, in the western, southwestern part of it. Culturally and, his, and politically speaking, the Quran um, emerge, is proclaimed at a time where this part of the world is belonging to the um, Himyarite uh, part of the world, the antique, so to say, the late antique empire of the Himyarites, in not far from the city of Najran. Uh, recently, Syriac inscriptions were discovered, which is a quite exciting uh, novelty. Uh, the inscription on the screen is difficult to get hold of for good uh, images. These are pictures circulating on Twitter. Uh, however, the French uh, archaeological mission has discovered in 2020 two inscriptions apparently that are going to be prepared and edited. This would be a third one. Those discovered by the French uh, mission are believed to be older in the maybe pre-Islamic period that what you see might be rather a document of the later period. This is a symbol for a lot of discoveries and movement on the level of epigraphy that has dramatically changed the field of Quranic studies also with its implication for the history of the Arabic script. Those inscriptions here in the screen illustrate predecessors of the Arabic script from Syria or what is today Syria and uh, Jordan, I mean, Syria in, in the, for the two cases. But meanwhile, we have other discoveries also from Saudi Arabia, what is today Saudi Arabia, not far from Najran, where we find predecessors of the Arabic script dated to the end of the 5th century and here we are um, almost 100 years earlier than what we believed as time of origin of the Arabic script. So this, what you see here on the screen, I do not get into details, edited by um, Christian Robin. These uh, texts are in a script that could be labeled proto or paleo uh, Arabic, Arabic script. So the Syriac inscription points to the wider spread and reception of Syriac literature. You could read it as with that implication. Of course, Arabia is a complex part of the world when it comes to scripts and languages. I have mentioned the Himyarite Empire, late antique Yemen, where we have a Christian king ruling, but a type of Christianity that somehow is the outlier to the other Christian uh, cultures of the Middle East, as our speaker knows better than me, where usually you have script and um, language being used also in a liturgical context. This liturgical use is not really, as far as I can see, not attested in the South Arabian part, but in texts that uh, Philip Froness will explain to us later. 
I'm jump a little bit my slides. It is remarkable that the inscription that is taken from the, that is a monumental inscription uh, written by King Abraha to commemorate the repair of the Mareb Dam, the most important, I mean the, the most important economic device for the South Arabian economy. Um, it commemorates a kind of trinity that is a bit odd and not in full harmony with the Trinity as we know it from Orthodox Christianity because the second position of the Trinity is the Messiah and uh, not Christ, his Messiah, yeah, it's not his son. A Christology that has three parts but avoids somehow the dogma of incarnation. We are used to talk about late antiquity. Late antiquity, if we leave uh, our mode of definition, can be defined by media culture. Late antiquity is the time, as um, Mrs. Shipke says in her history of the book in late antiquity, sorry for not having included the full quote, but Shipke says that um, the codex comes into full power in late antiquity, whereas antiquity still had the script roles going alongside with them. And precisely in this codex culture, the uh, relate, there seems to be some kind of relationship between Syriac a script used in codices, parchment codices. The Syriac script usually have the two um, columns, whereas the early Quranic codices have just one. There is no attested occurrence of a codex of the Quran where you would have two columns. Another topic for a discussion where these columns come from. South Arabia as context of the Quran uh, has some, it makes sense to consider South Arabia as context with regard to some items we have seen. Um, let me jump here a little bit. Um, yes, there is one element because after our long discussion with uh, Philip today, uh, we had, we were discussing various items of, uh, that could explain to us how Christian ideas or how ideas of Jacob of the Ruz, of the Ruk more particular come, are echoed in the Quran. We have to explain or at least to suggest the, uh, an hypothesis how this was happened. Dirk and Angelica have mentioned the idea of um, feasts and liturgical commemoration alongside with these feasts. One also has to uh, take in, into account that uh, Christianity is referenced and known in the peninsula in some of the texts we have seen, but also in some of the uh, not so perhaps known prophetic movement in Arabia as they are reported, reported in the sources. I mean the so-called counter-prophets, Musailima Tulaiha, of which we learn in a kind of mirrored polemical image in the early Islamic tradition, prophets that belong to their tribe but that are anchored in a kind of very similar monotheistic belief, breaking a bit with the idea of a jahiliya, a pagan context, where we find nature as a, as a sign, where we have modes of proclamation that remind us to those attributed to the prophet in the early uh, Sira tradition. We have an origin of revelation, which is very important. Ar-Rahman reported to some of these counter prophets like Musailima. Now, Rahman is specifically the name of God in South Arabia, a term affiliated also to similar names of God in the, in the, um, um, names of God in the Talmud and Jewish heritage. So there is a whole world to explore how Jacob or Syriac tradition met or entered or was received in the Arabic space. Let me come to the main person of our, or the second main person of our evening today, Jacob of Serug. We are um, 
celebrating this year the anniversary or the, or the 1,500 years of his of the year where he is said to have died. Uh, Dr. Fornes uh, mentioned that there might be a different theory about the year uh, of his death and I urged him or I asked him not to mention this, not to destroy this beautiful uh, jubilee that we hold. And I'm very happy that uh, Philip Fornes has uh, patience enough to give another Jacob of Seruk lecture this year. It's not the only one as I could learn from the internet and also from him personally. Our speaker is a church historian with a wider scope. He studied in different places in the United States, defended his dissertation about Christology of Jacob of Seruk in Princeton with Professor McVeigh. He has been living in Germany for quite a long time. His dissertation was defended in 2016. In 2018, his book about the, under the title Preaching Christology uh, is available and was printed. He is at the moment in Frank, based in Frankfurt, where he lives with his family and currently in a BMBF project, in a research project that is funded like the one that uh, our friend and colleague Ali Arai had a couple of years ago, two years ago. His BMBF project is about cultural exchange between Syria and Ethiopia, Kulturaustausch von Syrien nach Ethiopian. So we have here a specialist for the Christian oriental cultures and I'm happy that uh, Philip Fornes is curious and interested to include the Quran in this reflection. Usually it is us, uh, I mean our research team in Corpus Quranicum that is looking for people who are interested to look into the context of the Quran, you can twist it around and also you can make sense of the Quran in the context of Jacob of Seruk. I jump to the very beginning of our project Corpus Quranicum when uh, Angelika Neuwig, Nikolai Sina and myself, we were active in preparing the way to submit a proposal to the academy. There was a book, Die syro Armeische Lesart des Koran from Christoph Luxenberg, meanwhile available in English, that has caused in the year 2000 a big discussion about the seriousity of the Koran. Um, this book, one might, I mean, I'm personally, uh, convinced that very little of the emendations Luxembourg is, is proposing are valid, but this book was of extreme importance and gave a way to a research debate to, to which to a certain, in a certain way also we ourselves are indebted. Our reaction was at that time a conference, uh, the proceedings of which are published in a volume under the title The Quran in Context. And it's precisely this context that um, uh, gave us reason to have Philip Fonnes here this evening. We are happy to have already been able to discuss various items of possible collaboration, context for Jacob of Seru, context of the Quran, and we are looking with uh, pleasure into the next year perhaps to have chances to continue our discussion. Dear Philip, thank you very much for accepting this lecture this evening. We are looking forward to your presentation. Thank you very much. First, let me thanks, uh, express my thanks to Professor Richter, to Drs. Hartwig and Drs. Mar um, Dr. Marx um, for the warm welcome and the kind introduction. I'm very grateful for this invitation to be in Berlin and honored to deliver the Corpus Chronicum lecture this year. I hope very much that this will lead to many opportunities for collaboration in the future and be the start of a conversation about bringing the fields of Eastern Christianity and the study of early Islam even closer. One of the major developments in the recent study of late antiquity is embodied, with, embodied within the Corpus Chronicum project. Increased interaction between scholars of late antique religions, such as Judaism and Christianity, and scholars of early Islam have resulted in two things. First, the study of late antiquity has been enriched and expanded by including the Quran and, Quran and other early Islamic texts in its purview. 
And second, the Quran has been contextualized with reference to Jewish and Christian texts written in late antiquity. A fundamental aspect of this trend in scholarship is the identification of parallels in content between the Quran and other texts. The database of the Corpus Quranicum is a testament to the breadth of this research. The identification of echoes of Jewish and Christian sources in the Quran enables us to understand better how the original recipients, the early hearers of the Quran, may have received its message. They were not individuals with a blank slate, but people with knowledge of different literary and religious traditions. This background would have helped them understand the distinct accent that the Quran places on its retelling of biblical stories and other narratives. The examination of literature written in the Aramaic dialect of Syriac has proven fruitful for the study of the environment of the Quran. The Syriac language is associated with the city of Edessa and is first attested in the first century of the Common Era. There's some evidence that it was used for administrative functions within Edessa and to a certain extent in the broader region. Jewish communities may well have translated the Old Testament into Syriac in the second century, and Syriac became a literary lingua franca of the Christian communities in the Eastern Roman Empire and the Western Persian Empires by the 4th and 5th centuries. A significant body of literature survives in Syriac from the 4th through 7th centuries that has proven valuable in considering the literary landscape in which the Quran emerged. I come to the study of the environment of the Quran as a scholar of the Christian traditions of late antiquity, seeking to understand how these traditions were received, reshaped, and reinterpreted in early Islam. Much of my own research has focused on the figure of Jacob of Sarug, who left behind one of the largest corpora of Syriac writings from late antiquity. Many echoes of Jacob's writing have been found in the Quran, so that it seems that the early recipients of the Quran may well have been familiar with some of the interpretive traditions preserved in his writings. I should note, as Dr. Marx has already, that 2021 has been a remarkable year for Jacob of Sarug. This year is the 1500th anniversary of Jacob's death, and it's been marked with several conferences, including one in Berlin just two weeks ago. Germany had a special role to play in the commemoration of this anniversary year. Just 10 days ago, a special liturgy was held in the monastery of Jacob of Sarug in Warburg, Germany, to bless the Myron oil, that is, the oil that's used for baptism. This is the first time that this liturgy has been celebrated in the diaspora community of the Syriac Orthodox Church. For us this evening, this may serve as a reminder that comparative studies of Eastern Christian traditions and early Islam contribute very much to appreciating the different cultural traditions that are present in our modern society. All this background makes it especially appropriate in the waning weeks of 2021 to see what I see as one of the most forward-looking aspects of research on Jacob of Sarug, namely the intersection of his writings with the Quran. This evening, I'd like to offer a slightly different perspective on Jacob's works as texts from the environment of the Quran. I'll ask how Jacob's works were read in the period leading up to and concurrent with the emergence of the Quran. Which communities read Jacob's works? Why did they read this works? And what does all of this tell us about the echoes that we find of Jacob's works in the Quran? My presentation will proceed in three stages. First, we'll look at historical connections between Jacob and the Arabian Peninsula that suggest that his ideas, in some form, circulated in communities there during his lifetime. Second, we'll consider a few echoes of Jacob's works in the Quran and see which different types of echoes we can see. And third, we'll look at different ways that Jacob's works circulated and were read in the time that the Quran emerged. That is, I will locate works, Jacob's works, in late antique reading culture so that we may consider how echoes of Jacob and the Quran may have come to be. I hope that this presentation will thus offer one new lens for considering where and in which context traditions common to the Quran and Jacob were recounted and known in, six, in the 6th and 7th centuries. Before we turn to parallels between Jacob's writings and the Quran, it will be useful to consider some of the historical connections between the Arabian Peninsula and the reason where Syriac was the literary lingua franca. Let's begin with a few remarks about Jacob and his life. Jacob of Sarug was born sometime in the middle of the 5th century of the Common Era. By his own account, he studied in the city of Edessa sometime in the 460s or 470s. Edessa is now the city of Urfa in southeastern Turkey located not far from the border with Syria. 
The city of Edessa was an intellectual hub in Jacob's lifetime, with at least three Christian schools attested, not to mention those of other religious communities. The works of Greek authors, as Jacob himself tells us, were being translated into Syriac at the time that he studied there. So this isn't just an exclusively Syriac environment that he's dealing with. This is a place where cultures are coming together. After or during his studies, Jacob became a priest and later took on the role of a periodautes. This is a Greek term that indicates they took on some of the responsibilities of a bishop, ordaining other clergy and so forth in rural regions. So something like an itinerant priest. At the very end of his career, around 518 or 519, he became bishop of the city of Batnai in the region of Saruk. You can see from the map on the screen that these cities are fairly close to each other, about 40 kilometers. Um, and Batnai of Saruk, which is now Saruch in southeastern Turkey, is directly on the, the Syrian-Turkish border. Jacob died in 521. We think. <laughs> Jacob's writings consist of between three and four hundred sermons, or homilies, and 42 letters. His corpus of sermons forms the third largest in terms of number and size among all early Christian authors. So we can only compare this in size to Augustine of Hippo and John Chrysostom. So we're dealing with an immense corpus. Most Syriac from this times were written in poetic meter. This is a very distinct aspect of the Syriac tradition this time compared to other traditions of preaching. His corpus of letters is also the largest set of letters in Syriac, attested up to the end of the 6th century. The breadth of his corpus is one of the main reasons his works have served as such an point of reference for identifying echoes of Syriac literature in the Quran. Jacob wrote a lot, and we have a lot of what he wrote, so we can find these echoes if we're looking for them. Jacob's homilies have been much more thoroughly than studied than his letters, but it is letters that offer insight into the historical circumstances of his own life. He authored one letter to the Christian community in the city of Najran, in the kingdom of Himyar in the southern Arabian Peninsula. This letter thus serves as a fascinating starting point for considering the circulation of traditions preserved in his works in the Arabian Peninsula. We'll consider Jacob's letter in some more depth in a moment, but first it's important to note that the connections between Syriac authors from Upper Mesopotamia and the Southern Arabian Peninsula are not restricted to Jacob. Indeed, this evening we've already seen an inscription from this region around Najran. At least two other known figures come into consideration here who are around contemporaneous with Jacob. The Syriac author Philoxenus was a city, a bishop of the city of Mabug or Hierapolis, located in the same general region as Jacob. A Syriac work states that Philoxenus was responsible for sending and ordaining two bishops of the city of Najran. Another contemporary of Jacob of Sarug, Simeon of Beth Arsham, lived in the Persian Empire and authored a letter about the persecution endured by the Christian community in Himyar. Both Philoxenus and Simeon were members of the same ecclesiastical movement as Jacob. That is, they were all part of the network of clerics who opposed the theology of the imperial church. Specifically, Jacob, Philoxenus, Simeon, and, and others rejected the theology of Christ promoted by a council that took place in 451 in the city of Chalcedon. Chalcedon is now part of Istanbul, located just across from the main city, uh, just across the Bosphorus. Leaders of the anti-Chalcedonian movement, like Jacob, were connected to the Christian community in Najran and sought to exert influence on it. This all forms a context for the interpretation of Jacob's letter to the Christian community of Najran. This letter begins as follows. To the chosen athletes, the friends of true victory, the astonishing and the powerful, the servants of God, the truly faithful or Christian brothers, and the tested confessors in the city of Najran of the Himyarites. The lowly Jacob, who is from the region of Edessa, the faithful city of the Romans, in Jesus the light of the Gentiles and the hope of the worlds, and the judge of the dead and the living. Greetings. In this opening, Jacob identifies himself with the Roman Empire, and more specifically with the region of Edessa. He alludes to sufferings endured by the Christian community of Najran by referring to them as athletes, so, the con uh, so imagery of a contest, an agon, and especially confessors. This is a technical term for those who have suffered but not been killed for their faith. The persecution of the Christian community in Najran is a hotly debated topic, and there are very few reliable sources for it. Jacob died before the better attested persecution in 523, 
So it's unclear what the extent, if any, of the persecution to which he alludes here may have been. The remainder of the letter is dedicated to reframing the persecution that the Christian community had suffered in terms of his understanding of Christ, that is, the Christology promoted by Jacob and the anti-Chalcedonian movement. In regard to Christology, he describes their suffering as reflecting the sufferings of Christ. But as the eye of your soul looks with understanding on the sufferings of the cross, are you not able to regard your sufferings as sufferings? For are you not able to say, if the immortal one by his will was handed over to death for our life, for us who are subjected to death by the decree of the transgression of the law, how much more is it right for us to give ourselves over to death for his truth, so that we might honor by our death the death that was on our behalf? In other places in this letter, Jacob polemicizes against polemis, uh, opposing views of Christology. Thus, Jacob communicated his understanding of Christology, one of the most hotly debated topics in the Roman Empire, in theology at the time, to the Christian community in Nazran. Jacob's letter to the Himyarites is a bit frustrating for historians. It provides very little in the ways about the de of details of the Christians of Najran, and Jacob may well have known almost nothing about the community, and there's no evidence they ever traveled to the region. What he wrote about Christology could have appeared elsewhere in his writings and seems rather generic, at least for his corpus. But for our purpose of understanding the environment of the Quran, this letter forms an important source. First, it confirms the general picture of the interest that anti-Chalcedonian leaders like Jacob had in communicating with the Christian community in the southern Arabian Peninsula. The few preserved sources that reference this relationship must only be the tip of the iceberg. Second, it is significant that Jacob communicates his Christology to this community. This is a key point. This means that he chose to relate some of the same theological teachings found in his other writings to the community of Najran in the southern Arabian Peninsula. This letter provides the strongest evidence that some of Jacob's ideas were circulating in the Arabian Peninsula even during his lifetime. In the second part of my talk, I'd like to present a few of the echoes of Jacob of Sarug found in the Quran. We will specifically examine three different types of echoes that reveal a scale of connections between Jacob and the Quran. Sometimes Jacob's works merely represent themes known from the Syriac tradition as a whole. Other times, the chronological proximity of Jacob to the Quran proves most important, as Jacob's works demonstrate that specific ideas were being discussed in the years immediately before the emergence of the Quran. Yet other echoes point to a very strong connection between Jacob's specific writings, or the specific traditions preserved within them, and the Quran. Jacob Sarug wrote extensively on the Bible, and the Quran contains fascinating retellings and interpretations of the biblical text. It's not surprising that there are many points of connection between Jacob's biblical interpretation and the Quran. Let's begin with the fall of humanity from the book of Genesis. The well-known story of Adam and Eve eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil results in their exile from paradise, from the Garden of Eden. The Bible describes the departure of Adam from the Garden as follows. The Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the Garden of Eden he placed a cherubim, and a sword flaming and turning to guard the way to the tree of life. It may seem insignificant, but for our purposes, it's important that the biblical image of Adam's exile from paradise seems to be on flat land. There's a garden where the trees are planted and Adam is driven out from this garden. Angels, here specifically specified as cherubim, are placed at an entrance to prevent Adam from coming back in. Jacob of Sarug comments on this very passage in some of his works, and the image of a flaming sword plays an important role in the Syriac interpretive tradition. But it is Jacob's understanding of the geography of the garden and the fall that shows a fascinating parallel with the Quran. In my explication of this, I'll draw on the work of Gabriel Said Reynolds. Let's consider how Adam's exile from Eden is presented in the second surah of the Quran. The most important part of this retelling, for our purposes, reads as follows. We said, O Adam, dwell with your maid in paradise, and eat thereof freely whensoever you wish, but do not approach this tree, lest you should be among the wrongdoers. Then Satan caused them to stumble from it, and he dislodged them from what state they were in. 
And we said, get down, being enemies of one another. On the earth shall be your abode and sustenance for a time. Then Adam received certain words from his Lord, and he turned to him clemently. Indeed, he is the all-clement, the all-merciful. We said, get down from it altogether. Yet should any guidance come to you from me, those who follow my guidance shall have no fear, nor shall they grieve. There is clearly an echo of the Bible in the Quran's telling of the story. Adam is told to dwell with his companion in paradise and to eat from every tree except for one. The serpent, here explicitly said to be Satan, makes him eat from it. They are punished by being exiled. What is interesting for our purposes about their exile is that they are told to get down, as though paradise were somehow on elevated ground. This small detail in the Quranic account forms a parallel with the image of paradise as being on a mountain, which is well attested in Syriac literature. We see this reflected in Jacob's homily on Adam's departure from paradise, in which he represents this moment as a battle or contest between Adam and Satan. He writes, Look, O discerning ones, at the battle of Adam and Satan, for the foot of the two of them slipped in the same place. When the evil one was fighting so that he might knock down the house of Adam, Adam fell from the step of the heavenly ones. When Adam's fall cast him down from among the angels into the deep, Satan seized Adam and fell with him since he had become weak. The language of slipping, knocking down, casting down, and plunging into the deep reflects a similar geographical image of paradise as a mountain from which one could slip and fall down. This is significant because both Jacob and the Quran have a different geographical conception of paradise than was directly or indirectly implied by the Bible. The Quran must be drawing on another image of paradise. This parallel forms one type of echo of Jacob's works in the Quran. This echo is not so strong that the Quran must be drawing specifically on Jacob's homily on Adam's departure. Rather, Jacob is a representative of the broader Syriac tradition. Indeed, the same image of paradise as a mountain can be found in the works of Ephraim the Syrian, a Syriac poet from the 4th century who greatly influenced Jacob. Such echoes of Jacob's writings in the Quran are in fact echoes of the Syriac theological tradition writ broadly. These echoes give us insight into the theological milieu in which the Quran emerged, but they may well be echoes of the Syriac tradition in general, and not specifically of Jacob's works. We will now move from the conception of the fall of humanity at the beginning of the world to ideas about the end of the world. Thought about the end of times, known as eschatology, is found throughout the biblical text. We can think here of the prophetic books of Daniel, Zechariah, and others from the Hebrew Bible. And eschatological thought recurs throughout the New Testament as well, in the Gospels, in Paul's letters, and of course in the book of Revelation. We see this eschatological thought occur in many contexts. It encourages ethical behavior, as one always needs to be vigilant and ready for the end to come. Eschatological thought also addresses the concerns of oppressed people, seeking to imagine an end to the difficulties they face. Finally, thought about the end times addresses questions regarding ultimate reality. That is, what will remain when the present world passes away? Eschatological thought occurs in many places in the Quran, and I'd like to highlight one passage where a connection between Jacob of Sarug and the Quran has been identified by the Corpus Chronicum project. We'll begin here again with a passage from the Bible, and specifically one of Jesus' eschatological statements. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus states, But about that day and hour no one knows, neither the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. The idea that the end of the world will come unexpectedly, without warning, is common to the Bible, the Syriac tradition, and the Quran. This idea appears in several passages in the Quran, as I've listed on the slide. We'll take a closer look at just one of these before turning to one of Jacob's sermons. The 45th surah in the Quran begins with a reference to the descent of the scriptures from God and the signs of God that are found in creation. People should understand from the alternation of night and day, from the animals on the earth, from the rain sent down, that it is God who orchestrates all creation. The surah continues by referring to the revelation given to the children of Israel. Those who do not heed these signs will be judged. Then the surah comes to a depiction of the end times that reflects similar ideas to what we've already encountered in the Gospel of Matthew. This rather long quotation will offer one idea of how eschatology is represented in the Quran. I quote, They say there is nothing left but the life of this world. We live and we die, and nothing destroys us but time. 
but they do not have any knowledge of that and they only make conjectures. When our clear signs are recited to them, their only argument is to say, bring our fathers back to life if you are truthful. Say, it is God who gives you life, then he makes you die. Then he will gather you on the day of resurrection in which there is no doubt, but most people do not know. To God belongs the kingdom of the heavens and the earth, and when the hour sets in, the falsifiers will be losers on that day, and you will see every nation fallen on its knees. Every nation will be summoned to its books. Today you will be requited for what you used to do. This is our book, which speaks truly against you. Indeed, we used to record what you used to do. As for those who have faith and do righteous deeds, their Lord will admit them into his mercy. This is a manifest triumph. But as for the faithless, they will be asked, were not my signs recited to you, but you were disdainful and you were a guilty lot. When it was said, God's promise is indeed true, and there is no doubt about the hour, you said, we do not know what the hour is. We know nothing beyond conjectures, and we do not possess any certainty. The end of this long quotation is most important for our consideration today. Here we find the statement, we do not know what the hour is. We can certainly hear in this passage an echo of Jesus' words about the unknown day and hour at the, which the world will end. The surah portrays those who do not recognize God's signs and deny knowledge of the hour of judgment and the end, denying any sort of afterlife at all. These eschatological ideas are also found in authors like Jacob of Sarug. Indeed, there are at least 10 homilies attributed to Jacob on the end not to mention many more homilies and biblical passages that have eschatological content. The Corpus Chronicum project identified an important connection between Surah 45 and Jacob's homily in the end of the world. In this homily, Jacob writes, Behold, the day of judgment hangs hiddenly above our head, and no one knows when it will bend down and fall upon us. Behold, the end is standing at the door and waiting for us, and we do not know at what hour it will enter and come to us. The last line certainly echoes Jesus' statement about Matthew, about the unknown day and hour. There is a further commonality between Jacob and the Quran through the shared theme of judgment, the day of resurrection in the Quran, and the day of judgment in Jacob. So what are we to make of this echo of Jacob and the Quran? Couldn't we simply identify it as an echo of the Bible rather than of Jacob? This is certainly a possibility. But there's an important aspect we would miss if we ignore the common material common to Jacob and the Quran. The questions about the Bible that late antique authors like Jacob addressed form part of the religious milieu surrounding the Quran. There are passages in the Bible that hardly receive any attention from late antique interpreters. And several books of the New Testament, for example, were not translated into Syriac until a late date, indicating a general lack of interest in parts of their content. The fact that a figure like Jacob dedicated ten homilies to the end of the world and that communities copied and preserved these works in the 6th and 7th centuries forms an important context for understanding the Quran's eschatology. The echo in Surah 45 of eschatological traditions common to the Bible and Jacob reminds us that eschatology was a topic widely discussed on the eve of Islam. In some, Jacobs of Sarug's homily is important here as a comparative source because it testifies to the theological questions being discussed within the religious milieu in which the Quran emerged. Questions about eschatology would have had great resonance among the early recipients of the Quran familiar with these traditions. We'll now consider a third and final echo that appears in the account of the companions of the cave in Surah 18. Unlike the two previous two echoes, this one does not relate to the Bible, but comes from Christian stories about the saints. The tale of the companions of the cave is known from several Greek and Syriac Christian texts and runs briefly as follows. During the persecution of Christians under the Emperor Decius in the mid-third century, seven or eight young men refuse to offer incense at an altar of the Greco-Roman gods. They are arrested but flee to a cave outside the city of Ephesus. God puts them into a deep sleep, and they wake up after over 150 years in the reign of Emperor Theodosius II. They are amazed to discover that Ephesus is now a Christian city. Jacob of Sarug's homily on the sleepers of Ephesus is on the same story and preserves some of the earliest traditions regarding it. In a focus study, Sidney Griffith has demonstrated seven, several striking echoes of Jacob's homily in the Quran. By reading the two texts in parallel, one gains insight into how the hearers of the Quran would have perceived the specific emphases of the Quranic account as opposed to other versions of the story. 
let me highlight just three common aspects of Jacob's homily in the Quranic account. The opening line of the Quranic account reads, do you suppose that the companions of the cave and the inscription were among our wonderful signs? The inscription, this term, has posed challenges for interpreters of this passage. Two places is in Jacob's of Sarug's homily on the sleepers of Ephesus refers to tablets of lead and may thus offer a clue into the meaning of this term. The tablets are mentioned at the entombment of the youths. I quote, two sophists, sons of princes, were present there, and they thought that the Lord was going to resurrect them. They made tablets of lead, and they set them beside them. They wrote on them the names of the sons of light, and the reason why the youths went into the cave to hide, and at what era they had fled from Decius the king. The tablets are also mentioned a second time when Theodosius II comes to the tomb to verify the miracle, so after the sleepers of Ephesus have woken up. Jacob writes, he took up the tablet of lead and he began to read why the children had entered into the cave to hide. Thus, comparison with the homily of Jacob on the legend of the sleepers of Ephesus offers a clue into the meaning of this rather obscure word. This is still debated whether this is actually to be seen as a parallel, but it provides an evidence for the type of specific detail that's found in Jacob's works and in the Quran and not in other traditions. The homily of Jacob of Sarug on the sleepers of Ephesus provides another helpful hint into a passage of the companions of the cave in the Quran. After the youth are sent to sleep, the following is stated about the entrance to the cave. You will suppose them to be awake, though they are asleep. We turn them to the right and to the left, and at the threshold their dog lies stretching its forelegs. If you come upon them, you will surely turn to flee from them, and will be filled with the terror of them. The dog who guards the entrance to the cave is somewhat mysterious. It does not appear in other pre-Islamic accounts of the companions of the cave of the sleepers of Ephesus. But it seems to be related to the imagery of a shepherd, and the shepherd dog as preserved in the legend in Jacob's homily on the sleepers of Ephesus. Jacob writes, They went up the mountain, they entered the cave and stayed there. They called out to the Lord in a doleful voice and spoke thus, We beseech you, good shepherd, who has chosen his servants. Guard your flock from this wolf who thirsts for blood. The Lord saw the faith of the blessed lambs, and he came to give a good wage for their recompense. He took their spirits and brought them up to heaven, and he left a watcher to be the guardian of their limbs. The Syriac word for watcher in Jacob's homily, ira, usually is interpreted as an angel. This is indeed a general meaning of this term in Syriac. But the association with the shepherding imagery for God in Jacob's account, good shepherd, the lambs, and the description of the watcher as the one who guards the youth may have led to an interpretation of the watcher as the shepherd dog, as reflected in the Quran. Finally, Christian accounts of the legend of the sleepers of Ephesus disagree on the number of youth who hid in the cave. While Jacob of Sarug's homily has eight, others have seven. One Quranic passage seems to reflect knowledge of the debates over the number of the youth. I quote, they will say they are three, their dog is the fourth of them, and they will say they are five, their dog is the sixth of them, taking a shot at the invisible. They will say they are seven, their dog is the eighth of them. Say, my Lord knows best their number, and none knows them except a few. So do not dispute concerning them except for a seeming dispute, and do not question about them any of them. The reference to the different numbers of youth in the Quran highlights a final aspect of the benefit of a comparative study of, of the Quran in Jacob's homily. The Quranic text forms a witness to the ongoing debates over the text and in this way helps contextualize Jacob's homily and other Syriac literature that preserves the story. In sum, a comparison of certain details in the Quranic account of the companions of the cave and the homily on the same story by Jacob of Sarug helps clarify certain details in the Quranic account. By looking at Jacob's homily and other related literature, we're in a better position to understand how the story of the companions of the cave circulated in late antiquity, and thus what expectations the early recipients of the Quran may have had when they heard it. This one story thus serves as an example of the fascinating connections being explored between the Quran and texts from the environment of the Quran, like Jacob of Sarug's homily. We can now take stock of the three different types of echoes we have seen. In the first echo, we saw that Jacob and the Quran share a common conception of the geography of the Garden of Eden. Here, Jacob represents a broader trend in Syriac literature. 
In the second echo, we saw how discourse surrounding the end times has parallels in the Bible, Jacob's works, and the Quran. Jacob's discussion of the end times just over a hundred years before the emergence of the Quran reminds us that eschatology was a common topic in the religious environment of the Quran. Finally, the echoes of Jacob's retelling of the companions of the cave in the Quran forms an excellent example of an echo that suggests a strong connection between the traditions preserved in Jacob's writings and the Quran. Echoes as strong as this will force us to consider whether recipients of the Quran may have been familiar with an account of the story closely associated with Jacob's homily. In the final part of my talk, I'd like to turn our attention to a little explored area of research on Jacob's writings that I believe has important implications for interpreting the echoes of Jacob in the Quran. On the one hand, the biblical and theological traditions in Jacob's writings were communicated orally through preaching, hymns, and even in conversation, perhaps. We cannot underestimate oral communication as a path by which they were known to the early recipients of the Quran but we have almost no way of investigating this oral communication. What we do have are the manuscripts that transmitted Jacob's writings in late antiquity. Hundreds of Syriac manuscripts that date between the 5th and 7th centuries survive to the present. Among these are just under 70 manuscripts that preserve collections of sermons or homilies, including those of Jacob's. And these manuscripts are organized according to various principles. In the following, I'll explore these homily collections in order to shed light on the reasons that late antique communities chose to preserve Jacob's writings. This will additionally suggest who was reading these works and thus offer hints about where the traditions common to Jacob's writing in the Quran were transmitted and read. One of the primary ways that homilies were transmitted in late antiquity was in collections organized according to the biblical text, that is, as biblical commentaries. Such collections emerged as early as the 3rd century in Greek and around the turn of the 4th century in Latin. An excellent example are the commentaries of John Chrysostom. John Chrysostom was a Greek preacher of the 4th and 5th centuries who delivered homilies on diverse biblical passages in the cities of Antioch and Constantinople. An editing process after his preaching ensued in which diverse homilies were gathered and arranged according to the biblical text. That is, he didn't simply preach all of his homilies on one subject in one area, but they were gathered from diverse periods of his life and put together as a commentary. Chrysostom's commentaries were translated into Syriac in the course of the 5th and 6th centuries. The Syriac collections display efforts to enhance the value of these collections for biblical interpretation for their Syriac readers. For one, the producers of these manuscripts occasionally preface summaries of the homilies and relevant books of the Bible to the commentaries. Further, the titles to the individual homilies also cite the biblical text to clarify which passage will be discussed. And the Syriac translators in the 5th century often changed these titles to reflect the Syriac Bible rather than the Greek. Finally, notes at the end of some of these manuscripts provide information on where they were produced and used. They reveal both private ownership by priests and use in monastic communities. So we know that priests, individual priests and monasteries own these manuscripts. Interest in biblical interpretation motivated the translation and transmission of these homilies in Syriac reading communities. And we'll see that some of the same principles, the same uh, principles present in the literary circles that produce the translations of John Chrysostom's homilies are also reflected in the way that Jacobus Baruch's homilies circulated in the 6th century. There is a comparable organization of Jacobus Baruch's homilies. One of the earliest Manuscripts that contains his work, Manuscript Vatican Syriac 114, dates to the early 6th century, perhaps the first half of the 6th century, less than 20 years after Jacob's death. It begins with a set of 10 homilies on Moses, and then proceeds to four homilies from the book of Exodus, two from Leviticus, one from Numbers, and so forth, until the second to last homily on Hosea and his two wives. In short, it follows the order of the Old Testament books. Thus, this manuscript shows a very early effort to organize Jacob's homilies as a commentary on the entire Old Testament. Two additional manuscripts from the 6th century, manuscripts Vatican Syriac 251 and 252, and a fragmentary manuscript that I've shown here on the screen from an almost completely lost manuscript, show a similar organizational scheme of Jacob's homilies that are organized either according to the Old Testament or the New Testament. 
The title given to one of these manuscripts in the index even indicates that it's designed as, as a collection of homilies on the New Testament. As Chrysostom's homilies, these collections of Jacob's works were designed to be used by communities interested in biblical interpretation. When similarities in the interpretation of the Bible in the Quran and Jacob's homilies can be established, we should ask ourselves whether the homily could have circulated in such a collection. The Syriac evidence points towards clergy and monastics as the readers of these texts. We can then ask how such individuals and communities who are familiar with Jacob's homilies may have understood the Quranic account. In addition to biblical commentaries, Jacob's homilies also circulated in collections organized around monastic themes. Several Syriac manuscripts from the 6th and 7th centuries preserve this type of collection, and one manuscript from the 6th century includes a homily by Jacob. The manuscript survives in two parts, with a manuscript from the British Library and one from Egypt and Dar es um, which have only recently been discovered that they belong to the same manuscript, so we can only now um, after the publication of a catalog in the last 10 years, understand this collection as a whole. The manuscript begins with a homily by Ephraim the Syrian on Nineveh and Jonah, which is a text often associated with fasting, an appropriate monastic theme. This is followed by six homilies attributed to Ephraim on reprehension. There follow nine homilies attributed to the Syriac author Isaac of Antioch, on the solitaries, on mountain ascetics, on receiving brothers, four on the faith, and two on the love of money. After a short poetic text, the manuscript concludes with a homily by Jacob of Sarug on the rich man and Lazarus, so another homily related to the common ascetic topic of wealth. The collection of homilies in this manuscript reflects a broader trend in monastic book culture. The focus on ascetic themes and the collection of works by diverse authors help identify this manuscript as what has been called a monastic multiple text manuscript. Monastic collections emerged in late antique Egypt and Greek, and rapidly spread throughout the Mediterranean world. And in Syriac, we have many translations of these monastic, these Greek collections that came into Syriac and were reshaped for the communities there. What we have here is a manuscript that just has Syriac authors. So this is somewhat of a parallel movement where we're having texts gathered from diverse authors, diverse genres put together for a specifically monastic audience. And we have a few examples of this from late antiquity. That one of Jacob's homilies appears here related to the theme of wealth should not be surprising. Here too we consider, should consider whether Jacob's homilies that have commonalities with the Quran did or could have circulated in such a collection where they have been, would have been read by monastic communities. Two Syriac manuscripts offer evidence for a final type of homily collection, collections ordered according to the liturgical year, known as homiliaries. The development of Latin humiliaries has been the most thoroughly studied and can be summarized roughly as follows. The first liturgically ordered homily collections seem to have been single author collections, the earliest example dating to the early 5th century. A second step was the creation of collections of model sermons in the 5th and 6th centuries that contained the sermons of multiple authors and were often anonymized. So these are model sermons that would be used to educate priests who didn't have a formal education so that they'd have a basis for something to say on basically every Sunday within the liturgical year and the major feast days. The final step in Latin and also in Greek was the emergence of multi-author humiliaries that identify authorship, cover the entire liturgical calendar, follow a sequence of Sundays, and often contain a section for movable feasts. Such humiliaries may have emerged as early as the 6th century in Latin and perhaps Greek. We don't find any examples of this in Syriac till the 8th or 9th century, and it seems they didn't emerge until earlier than that, because the earliest ones are primarily consist of Greek homilies, with a couple Syriac ones thrown in. This becomes very dominant in Syriac at a later time. But there are two 7th century manuscripts, one dating to 603, one more generically to the 7th century based on comparison of the script, that have Jacob of Sarug's works and preserve evidence for single author homily collections already in the 7th century. The two manuscripts come from the British Library and the Vatican library, and each of them preserves a set of Jacob of Sarug's prose homilies on major feast days, Christmas, Epiphany, Lent, Palm Sunday or the Sunday of Hosannas, the Friday of the Passion, and the Sunday of the Resurrection. The first of these manuscripts, the one from the British Library, originally contained 41 of Jacob's letters followed by the six prose homilies. 
The second manuscript from the Vatican has a more diverse set of works organized in five parts. It's only the small collection of Jacob's works, uh, six prose homilies, that feature this liturgical ordering. This small collection of sermons by Jacob of Sarug, preserved in two manuscripts, displays parallel with the single author collections of sermons organized around the liturgical year that are known in Latin from the 5th and 6th centuries. With the liturgically ordered collections, we need to assume a different audience. Some of these collections were indeed used by monastic communities, and thus this category of collection does overlap with others. But humiliaries were also used for liturgical services attended by a broader swath of society. There's one Syriac, 6th century Syriac um, humiliary, indeed the only the third one that we have before the end of the 7th century, that includes addresses that are sp bespoken before specifically laity and the monastic um, audience who attend festal celebrations. It's possible to imagine that these prose festal homilies, ordered according to the six major feast days, were also read in liturgical settings attended by a more expansive range of society than the other homily collections. So if we want to think about the audience who might have been familiar with Jacob Sruk's tradition, it's these homilies, these six prose homilies, that preserve traditions that probably circulated wider than the other types of homilies. In sum, I've discussed how Jacob of Sarug's homilies circulated in three different types of homily collections. The first, biblical commentaries, were organized around the biblical text, apparently for private individuals, that is, priests, and monastic communities with interest in biblical interpretation. The second type of collection, ascetic or monastic collections, likewise assumes a restricted audience of monastics. The third type, liturgical homily collections, may well have been used in settings with a broader audience. In the previous part of my talk, we saw some of the specific connections drawn between Jacob of Sarug's homilies and the Quran. Projects like the Corpus Quranicum have demonstrated striking similarities that help us appreciate how the early hearers of the Quran would have encountered the distinct Quranic accent on these shared narratives. But this has generally been done in the abstract, as a comparison between two literary texts without direct reference to the individuals and communities familiar with these texts. By looking at the physical manuscripts in which Jacob of Sarug's homilies circulated in antiquity, we can start to think about in which concrete settings the ideas reflected in his homilies were communicated. We know that clergy and monastic audiences knew his works, but the two liturgically ordered homily collections suggest that others may well have as encountered his ideas on major feast days. Granting attention to the material transmission of Jacob's works thus places a personal face on the connections between his works and the Quran. In conclusion, this presentation has explored several facets of the connections between the Quran and Jacob of Sarug. We first examine Jacob's letter to the Christian community of Najran and the kingdom of Himyar. This letter demonstrates that some of Jacob's ideas circulated in the Arabian Peninsula, albeit in the southern Arabian Peninsula, even within Jacob's lifetime. We then saw several echoes of Jacob's works in the Quran related both to biblical interpretation as well as a tale about the saints. These three echoes of Jacob and the Quran are representative of the types of research being conducted on Jacob's works as part of the environment of the Quran. Finally, we considered how Jacob's homilies circulated physically in the 6th and 7th centuries. By looking at the material evidence for the circulation of these texts, we are in a better position to start thinking about the actual communities and individuals familiar with Jacob's works, who would have been in a position to perceive the connections between Jacob and the Quran. The investigation of the late antique context of the Quran necessitates specialists from different fields. Experts in early Islam will be able to analyze shared motifs in Jacob's works in the Quran in a more detailed way than I can do here. My own research focus on Jacob Sarug's works has made me interested in the way that his works were read in the period in which the Quran emerged. I thus offer this material perspective on the circulation of his works as a small contribution to the studies of the echoes of the Syriac tradition in the Quran. I hope that it will help us move collectively towards speaking more concretely about the individuals and the communities who would have been familiar with the literary motifs common to the Quran and the texts from the environment of the Quran. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Philip, for this very clear lecture uh, that uh, 
triggers a lot of reflections about the environment, or one may also say the word, the world of the Quran. If you compare Jacob of Saruk with other similar or unsimilar church fathers from the same tradition, what would explain this uh, tremendous ex um, success of his works and this broad reception that one could very well imagine to be somehow echoed and transformed and uh, opposed to, polemicized with in the Quran. Are there any formal reasons that make him a kind of positive outlier? One way to start answering this question is to compare um, Jacob and some of the earlier figures in the Syriac tradition and their reception in late antiquity. So in the fourth century, we have two Syriac authors, Afrahat, um, who probably came from the Persian Empire. It's really a collection of texts that's been shown very recently that was gathered together, could perhaps even multiple authors, it's hard to say exactly. Um, and we also have Ephraim the Syrian, who wrote an enormous amount of hymns that were transmitted in very large collections in late antiquity. There have been several arguments um, made for why Ephraim's works don't survive in the same great amount that other that the works of Jacob do, for example. Um, one of these arguments looks at the liturgical tradition um, and the way that liturgical collections were formed and how this changed in late antiquity. And so there is just simply a different way of um, forming um, the way that liturgical collections were transmitted. This is a very recent argument by Blake Hartung. Um, Aaron Butts has looked at how the Christological controversies may have played a role in the um, lack of reception of Ephraim's writings as the Christological content in Ephraim's works didn't um, make him very amenable to the post-Chalcedonian Christological controversies. So his works were no longer considered um, orthodox in a sense and, and couldn't be received in this way. So we have several different um, answers about why Ephraim's works didn't have as much success. Um, Jacob's, <laughs> um, Jacob's works were common, uh, were copied very widely in late antiquity and adapted well to this major change in the 8th and 9th century in which they could be placed into humiliaries. So some of it is probably luck on Jacob's part that as I've shown, there are three different types of collection that I've identified from these 70 manuscripts um, related to homilies and Jacob's works fit into all of these. He did write a lot of monastic themes, perhaps not as much as some of his contemporaries, but he has several homilies of monastic themes. He wrote a lot on the Bible, so you could form a Syriac sort of Bible, which they were receiving from the Greek tradition, translating into Syriac, and then suddenly they had an author whose works they could draw on to put together a commentary in the whole Old Testament, or a couple passages from each book, or something like this. Um, and the third is liturgical collections um, of homilies were just had their emergence at this time. So I think there's a, there's a confluence of them. And uh, perhaps a final point is that um, Jacob, in a way, popularizes, popularizes Ephraim. Um, Jacob takes over directly many of Ephraim's ideas, but he makes them in a more comprehensible way. Um, Ephraim's works are very dense. Um, the poetic quality is very high, but they're hard to follow. And Jacob's works are always written, almost always in the same meter, and they're much more easy to understand when you listen to them. Oh, yes. Please, uh, yeah, thank you very much. So this brings us back to the starting point and also to uh, what, what Dirk and Angelica, so to say, have uh, pointed at the role of liturgy, if mm. I understand you correctly. What I found also interesting in your talk was the different layers of audience, receptions, and when you mentioned these prose uh, works that probably had a very broad um, address, it reminded me vaguely of a figure you might have known of Qus bin Saida. There is a preacher mentioned in the city of Najran of which Islamic tradition has recorded Sajjah poems. This mm. is rhymed prose. and. Uh, these texts are not very long. There is a Polish habilitation or a larger book about his collections containing all mm. the Arabic works. We could also choose this as an item of our perhaps continuing mm -hmm. debate. I don't know if this 
proves to be a kind of echo of precisely Jacob, but at least it could be a kind of echo of something similar to what you perhaps were pointing. Hus mm -hmm. mm -hmm. is the name of this figure oh, in, reported in the in the context of the Quran by the Muslim tradition for this very important place, Najran, that is somehow not appearing in most of the uh, land of the maps for the emergence of Islam, but it as also mm. the inscription points to your Jacob's story of the Mad or the sermon about the martyrs it seems to be an extremely ordinary extraordinary point Najran, right mm -hmm. yes that's right mm -hmm. is uh, Najran connected from the syriac perspective uh, with other uh, figures than the martyrs i mean what is the role of Najran looking with a pair of syriac glasses so to say <laughs> We do have um, the, the book of the Himyarites, which is a very difficult book um, and to interpret. This is a book that was published in the 20th century, and um, there's been a variety of questions. It's very difficult to date. Um, it's difficult just to make uh, what to make of this, how to analyze it historically. But we do have in this, um, I believe it's in this work that Philoxenus um, Mabuk sends the bishops to Nasran. So in a way, there's a perception, at least reflected in this work, that the Syriac community cared for the Christianity in this part of the world. We could also think about this in terms of the Roman and Persian empires competition over the southern Arabian Peninsula. Jacob perceives himself as a Roman, as we saw very clearly at the beginning of this letter. That's the only time he names himself from Rome. It would also make sense if you're sending a letter to somewhere. It's also the only time he identifies himself as from Edessa. This is written after he's in Edessa. Oh, yeah. It's written at the end of his life. So we have two very interesting things about Edessa and about Rome having a caretaker function of sorts for this part of the world. And I think that's probably reflected also in the, the political um, um, happenings that, um, in this part of the world, the, the, the conflict between Persia and Rome happening in the Southern Arabian Peninsula. Well, thank you very much. I was, um, I missed two sentences because I was pointed oh, okay. to the screen and here we have a question from Muriel Debier from Paris. Mm. She says, thank you very much, Philip, for this interesting talk. I have a question about the transmission of Jacob's Mimro on the seven sleepers. In what type of collections was it transmitted? Since the mm. parallels are striking, what can we say about the concrete transmission of that specific Mimro. Mm. Yeah, I was not able to make any connections on this point to the late antique uh, transmission of this Mimro, unfortunately. <laughs> um, something that um, I can say something more in general, though, about mm, the transmission of Jacob's Jacob's hagiographical homily, so his homilies on the saints, which might grant some insight into this. Um, what we have at a later time period, in the 10th, 11th, and 12th centuries, is very large collections of Jacob's works that are being created. And these hagiographical homilies tend to go to the back of the collections because they're movable feast days. They also throw miscellany in there, so just about anything um, within that time period. But I think that's exactly the type of study that I'm interested in doing on the specific homilies for which we can find these really convincing parallels. I think that's exactly where we would gain more insight into the types of communities familiar with these specific ideas that we can also find in the Quran. So at the moment, I don't have an answer for the question, but that's, um, that's exactly what I'm hoping um, this talk will lead to. Thank you. Thank you, uh, dear Philip, for this uh, evening here, the lecture, the discussion, and also the perspective of other occasions. And uh, as we say in German, Fortsetzung folgt. That's at least what we hope. <laughs> so we thank you uh, very much. And also people here in Berlin, a small group, some much, there are many more outside, uh, apparently via Zoom. We thank you also for your patience and interest. And, and thank you very much. Thank you also to the technicians enabling this transmission to, I've seen colleagues in Turkey and in Iran and maybe other countries. Paris, Muriel Debier was with us, makes <laughs> us very proud. Thank you very much. Thank you.